Up until the 1970s, cryptography had been based on symmetric keys. That is, the sender encrypts their message using a specific key and the receiver decrypts using an identical key. As you may recall, encryption is a mapping from some message using a specific key to a ciphertext message. To decrypt a ciphertext, you use the same key to reverse the mapping. So, for Alice and Bob to communicate securely, they must first share identical keys. However, establishing a shared key is often impossible if Alice and Bob can't physically meet, or requires extra communications overhead when using the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Plus, if Alice needs to communicate with multiple people, perhaps she's a bank, then she's going to have to exchange distinct keys with each person. Now she'll have to manage all of these keys and send thousands of messages just to establish them. Could there be a simpler way? In 1970, James Ellis, a British engineer and mathematician, was working on an idea for non-secret encryption. It's based on a simple yet clever concept. Lock and unlock are inverse operations. Alice could buy a lock, keep the key, and send the open lock to Bob. Bob then locks his message and sends it back to Alice. No keys are exchanged. This means she could publish the lock widely and let anyone in the world use it to send her a message. And she now only needs to keep track of a single key. Ellis never arrived at a mathematical solution, though he had an intuitive sense of how it should work. The idea is based on splitting a key into two parts, an encryption key and a decryption key. The decryption key performs the inverse or undo operation which was applied by the encryption key. To see how inverse keys could work, let's do a simplified example with colors. How could Bob send Alice a specific color without Eve, who is always listening, intercepting it? The inverse of some color is called a complementary color, which when added to it produces white, undoing the effect of the first color. In this example, we assume that mixing colors is a one-way function because it's fast to mix colors and output a third and it's much slower to undo. Alice first generates her private key by randomly selecting a color, say red. Next, assume Alice uses a secret color machine to find the exact complement of her red and nobody else has access to this. This results in cyan, which she sends to Bob as her public key. Let's say Bob wants to send a secret yellow to Alice. He mixes this with her public color and sends the resulting mixture back to Alice. Now, Alice adds her private color to Bob's mixture. This undoes the effect of her public color, leaving her with Bob's secret color. Notice Eve has no easy way to find Bob's yellow since she needs Alice's private red to do so. This is how it should work. However, a mathematical solution was needed to make this work in practice. The solution was found by another British mathematician and cryptographer, Clifford Cox. Cox needed to construct a special kind of one-way function called a trapdoor one-way function. This is a function that is easy to compute in one direction, yet difficult to reverse unless you have special information called the trapdoor. For this, he turned to modular exponentiation, which we introduced as clock arithmetic in the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, as follows. Take a number, raise it to some exponent, divide by the modulus, and output the remainder. This can be used to encrypt a message as follows. Imagine Bob has a message which is converted into a number, m. He then multiplies his number by itself, e times, where e is a public exponent, then he divides the result by a random number n and outputs the remainder of the division. This results in some number c. This calculation is easy to perform. 
However, given only C, E, and N, it is much more difficult to determine which M was used because we'd have to resort to some form of trial and error. So this is our one-way function that we can apply to M, easy to perform but difficult to reverse. It is our mathematical lock. Now, what about the key? The key is the trap door, some piece of information that makes it easy to reverse the encryption. We need to raise C to some other exponent, say D, which will undo the initial operation applied to M and return the original message M. So both operations together is the same as M to the power of E, all raised to the power of D, which is the same as M to the power of E times D. E is the encryption, D is the decryption. Therefore, we need a way for Alice to construct E and D, which makes it difficult for anyone else to find D. This requires a second one-way function which is used for generating D, and for this, he looked back to Euclid. Over 2000 years ago, Euclid showed every number has exactly one prime factorization, which we can think of as a secret key. It turns out that prime factorization is a fundamentally hard problem. Let's clarify what we mean by easy and hard by introducing what's called time complexity. We have all multiplied numbers before and each of us has our own rules for doing so in order to speed things up. If we program a computer to multiply numbers, it can do so much faster than any human can. Here is a graph that shows the time required for a computer to multiply two numbers. And of course the time required to find the answer increases as the numbers get larger. Notice that the computation time stays well under one second even with fairly large numbers. Therefore it is easy to perform. Now compare this to prime factorization. If someone told you to find the prime factorization of 589, you will notice the problem feels harder. No matter what your strategy, it will require some trial and error until you find a number which evenly divides 589. After some struggle, you will find 19 times 31 is the prime factorization. If you were told to find the prime factorization of 437,231, you'd probably give up and get a computer to help you. This works fine for small numbers, though if we try to get a computer to factor larger and larger numbers, there is a runaway effect. The time needed to perform the calculations increases rapidly as there are more steps involved. As the numbers grow, the computer needs minutes, then hours, and eventually it will require hundreds or thousands of years to factor huge numbers. We therefore say it is a hard problem due to this growth rate of time needed to solve it. So factorization is what Cox used to build the trapdoor solution. Step one. Imagine Alice randomly generated a prime number over 150 digits long, call this P1. Then a second random prime number roughly the same size, call this P2. She then multiplies these two primes together to get a composite number N, which is over 300 digits long. This multiplication step would take less than a second. We could even do it in a web browser. Then she takes the factorization of n, p1 times p2, and hides it. Now if she gave n to anyone else, they would have to have a computer running for years to find the solution. Step two, Cox needed to find a function which depends on knowing the factorization of n. For this, he looked back to work done in 1760 by Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler. Euler continued to investigate properties of numbers, specifically the distribution of prime numbers. One important function he defined is called the phi function. It measures the breakability of a number. So given a number, say n, it outputs how many integers are less than or equal to n that do not share any common factor with n. For example, if we want to find the phi of 8, we look at all values from 1 to 8, then we count how many integers 8 does not share a factor greater than 1 with. Notice 6 is not counted because it shares a factor of 2, while 1, 3, 5, and 7 are all counted because they only share a factor of 1. Therefore, phi of 8 equals 4. 
What's interesting is that calculating the phi function is hard except in one case. Look at this graph. It is a plot of values of phi over integers from 1 to 1000. Now notice any predictable pattern. The straight line of points along the top represent all the prime numbers. Since prime numbers have no factors greater than 1, the phi of any prime number, p, is simply p minus 1. To calculate phi of 7, a prime number, we count all integers except 7, since none of them share a factor with 7. Phi of 7 equals 6. So if you're asked to find phi of 21,377, a prime number, you would only need to subtract 1 to get the solution, 21,376. Phi of any prime is easy to compute. This leads to an interesting result based on the fact that the phi function is also multiplicative. That is, phi a times b equals phi a times phi b. If we know some number n is the product of two primes, p1 and p2, then phi of n is just the value of phi for each prime multiplied together, or p1 minus 1 times p2 minus 1. We now have a trapdoor for solving phi. If you know the factorization for n, then finding phi n is easy. For example, the prime factorization of 77 is 7 times 11, so phi of 77 is 6 times 10, 60. Step 3. How to connect the phi function to modular exponentiation. For this, he turned to Euler's theorem, which is a relationship between the phi function and modular exponentiation as follows. m to the power of phi n is congruent to 1 mod n. This means you could pick any two numbers such that they do not share a common factor. Let's call them m and n. Say m equals 5 and n equals 8. Now, when you raise m to the power of phi n, or 4, and divide by n, you will always be left with 1. Now, we just need to modify this equation using two simple rules. First, if you raise the number 1 to any exponent k, you always get 1. In the same way, we can multiply the exponent phi n by any number k, and the solution is still 1. Second, if you multiply 1 by any number, say m, it always equals m. In the same way, we can multiply the left side by m to get m on the right hand side. And this can be simplified as m to the power of k times phi n plus 1. This is the breakthrough. We now have an equation for finding e times d, which depends on phi n. Therefore, it's easy to calculate d only if the factorization of n is known. Meaning d should be Alice's private key. It's the trap door which will allow her to undo the effect of e. Let's do a simple example to see all of this in action. Say Bob has a message he converted into a number using a padding scheme. Let's call this m. Then Alice generates her public and private key as follows. First, she generates two random prime numbers of similar size and multiplies them to get n, 3,127. Then she calculates phi of n easily since she knows the factorization of n, which turns out to 3,016. Next, she picks some small public exponent e, with the condition that it must be an odd number that does not share a factor with phi n. In this case, she picks e equals 3. Finally, she finds the value of her private exponent d, which in this case is 2 times phi of n plus 1 divided by 3, or 2011. Now, she hides everything except the value of n and e, because n and e make up her public key. Think of it as an open lock. She sends this to Bob to lock his message with. Bob locks his message by calculating m to the power of e mod n. Call this c, his encrypted message, which he sends back to Alice. Finally, Alice decrypts his message using her private key, d, accessed through her trapdoor. 
c to the power of d mod n equals Bob's original message m. Notice that Eve or anyone else with c, n, and e can only find the exponent d if they can calculate phi n, which requires that they know the prime factorization of n. If n is large enough, Alice can be sure that this will take hundreds of years even with the most powerful network of computers. This trick was immediately classified after its publication, however it was independently rediscovered in 1977 by Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Len Edelman, which is why it's now known as RSA encryption. RSA is the most widely used public key algorithm in the world, and the most copied software in history. Every internet user on earth is using RSA, or some variant of it, whether they realize it or not. Its strength relies on the hardness of prime factorization, which is a result of deep questions about the distribution of prime numbers, a question which has remained unsolved for thousands of years.